After the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a worsening of problems related to safety, security, mental and physical health, and risks of groups like women and children. Today, we will be talking about the strategy for participation developed with these collectives at risk of social exclusion in the city of New York to make them more resilient, to boost their capabilities to confront adversities and to take care of their mental health. In order to talk about this topic, we have the directors of the DiPaso Innovative Teaching Group, Marta Lora Tamayo, Professor of Administrative Law, and Antonio Lopez Pelaez of the Department of Social Work and Social Services at UNED. With them, an expert, a social worker specialized in these collectives that are most vulnerable and who develops social intervention projects in the city of New York. We give the floor to Antonio Lopez. Welcome, welcome again to our program of the participatory group at UNED. It's a pleasure to join you by radio. When you think about it, it's wonderful. Think about the Middle Ages and people writing heavy books, carrying them around. But however, we are like birds. We can fly to you through radio programs. We are very lucky because we can access different experiences, countries, experts that have many lessons learned with participation of the elderly, social groups, etc. We are very lucky to have the director of this project, Professor Marta Lora Tamayo, but also Yamil Marti, who has recorded another show with us. She is now working temporarily as a volunteer worker. She is a professor of the social work faculty at the Columbia University. So welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for being here, Yamil. Thank you for inviting me. So thank you again to the City Council of Madrid for this project that has created a network to share good participatory experiences shared by 50 cities. We have been working for two years providing through UNED the research, the academic support to create a good practices network to better deal with something that is so specific to mature democracies, which is the main role of citizens. Let's start with your participatory experiences. Tell us about the groups you work with. Well, I work and live in New York City and public participation is a challenge because there's a huge diversity of collectives, groups, people, and you need to tackle the specific needs of each group and collective needs because people live as part of a community. You can have a community of people from the Dominican Republic who live together with Mexican people, with African-American people. So how do you create a collective whilst attending to the individual needs of each group? My experience has been very positive. I think that communities want to have that voice and participation. Unfortunately, in history, we have learned that certain groups didn't have that voice. So we're talking about a social change, a change in psychological services, state services, social work, creating that collective conscience that projects should go hand in hand with communities. This is a very new project, but it's gained significant reputation. Well, Marta Lora knows a lot about Chicago and urban planning is key because these cities are designed for segregation in their structure. In this regard, and with such a huge diversity of communities, do you feel that participations are focused on each community, or do you look for strategies to help dialogue between communities? Well, in the Columbia University, it's based on the Washington Heights community. Columbia is the owner of many of the buildings in the area, so there's a certain resentment. Oh, you came here to take our community, but this is our community, so... Both sides need to cooperate. For example, in Colombia, the communities would like for services like academic services, research services, etc. As a university, we need to give back to the communities that are helping us. There are services that are specific to each community and sometimes they are more successful because of the group cohesion of that common identity. 
that helps the services work out fine. On the other hand, collective participation, more diverse participation is stronger. We see different voices, especially in public campaigns, campaigns for rights. The more people, the better and the stronger the voice. So we should really study the communities we're working with, understanding their strengths and needs, and from then onwards, design a participatory project that is adequate. What kind of project specifically have you participated? What is the content itself? Or what are the needs demanded by citizens through participatory processes? Are we talking about very tangible needs, for example, social services, education, etc.? Do they need a park, for example? Tell me about the experiences you've had. And also, have you seen positive results? Have you obtained results? Because many participatory processes create a lot of fatigue because the result is maybe not the one we expected. So tell us about your experience. My experience has been really positive. I've had experiences with the migrant and Mexican communities of New York, people that are undocumented, they live hidden basically from authorities, they are very scared, they don't know what their rights are, so the communities themselves attend the local church where they are taught their legal rights in the city. The community group asks for help and a group of attorneys teaches migrants about their rights and what they can do. For example, can they attend medical facilities? Will they be asked for documentation? What about if I'm stopped by the police? How does that relate to my migration status? So there's a lot of projects that are related to education, the need for social structures, services. You might not have the knowledge about this. On the other hand, there's prevention instead of remedy. The huge problem we have is that we have social problems because we don't solve, we don't prevent the problems themselves. So, for example, with children and parents, there are many projects where they are taught how to be a good parent, so to speak. We're talking about maybe young parents who do not have a lot of experience. They might not have the information about vaccines that they need to, to get before school, things like that. Through the COVID-19 pandemic, we have worked on awareness raising in those communities, communities that have a huge distrust of social me medical services and telling people that this is a collective process because if you're not vaccinated, you're putting others at risk. It's difficult to navigate these problems in the US, specifically in New York, and I suppose that in Madrid it's the same thing. Well, it's interesting what you're talking about because I think that in Madrid there was a huge highlight and visibility of the role of our public medical services. I think we're more than 90 something percent in terms of the vaccination rate against COVID-19. This is really outstanding because in many countries in the north of Europe, we see a higher rate of anti-vaxxers when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we do have a very collective concern. Well, answering the question of the results achieved by participation projects, I'd say yes, they are, especially for us social researchers, the success of an intervention, especially education services and projects. In the long term, many communities, if you work with them and participate with them, you don't have that continuity. You do not know what was actually achieved by the participation process, but so far, I'd say they do value these processes and it helps their mental health. For example, they realize that they have their own voice, they have a voting power that they are taken into account and listened to in the communities. For example, I've worked in Puerto Rico and in the US we have a research group with the Columbia and the Virginia universities working for the aging population of Puerto Rico. For example, the average age is 65 years old. So it's a very old country well just like ours well that population has children and grandchildren who have migrated due to the hurricane we had to suffer many years ago and many economic problems they have migrated to the rest of the u.s 
there are people who attempt to commit suicide, there are people with mental health problems, people who are traumatized by that hurricane, and the communities in Puerto Rico feel very lonely. So we need to create a common conscience, asking the communities what they need. For example, they talked about the neighborhood square, where they wanted to be able to meet with others in their community to play dominoes, to go for a coffee. These things are cost-effective, simple, but they can have a very beneficial long-term impact. So we are creating conscious, a common conscience in a community where people don't want to admit that they have problems, but they do, and they say, we want to receive help. How interesting. I find it fascinating the way in which you achieve these people to make these people participate. One of the main problems that we have felt throughout all these radio programs is the lack of interest, the lack of willingness to participate. There are many, many local programs, but then the participation rate is often very low. So how do you manage to convince these people, normally elderly people, to participate, to create these public spaces so that they don't disappear because normally they are replaced by a mall, by a restaurant. So how do you manage to get these people on board? How do you catch their attention? Because these are people that probably do not use social media very much. So how do you manage to make participation processes appealing to them? Yes, on the one hand, there's the lack of trust of those strangers. Why are you asking me all this information, etc.? In this world of information, we all know what can happen if information is mismanaged. So there are two elements there. On the one hand, the organization of an intervention research group, we need to get to know communities really well. They need to take on the task of researching historically where they come from, who is actually living in the community, who are the leaders in that neighborhood, and start to approach these leaders so that I don't feel, oh, the stranger is coming to ask me for information. If information comes through community leaders, then I feel more comfortable. On the other hand, there's an incentive there with getting to know the population. This aging population we know really wants to have company, to be heard, to be listened to. I think that coffee in my culture is key. Talking together in a square where we can sit down, go for a coffee, we talk to them in that close manner without formalities. No, we go to where they are. We approach them and not the other way around. And this leads to the openness of uh, these groups, for example, sexually abused women, abused by their partners physically or mentally, because of the trauma they have experienced, might find it difficult to share information. We need to be careful there with not re-traumatizing this group, taking into account their mental health. So you really need to get to know these groups and approaching them and not the other way around. In many of the countries that we have studied, we have colleagues of Marta from London, we all agree that we need to leave our comfort zones, leave our offices, make these processes very dynamic and approaching the groups themselves. If you allow me, I would like to ask you about something that catches my attention. My perception in the Western society is that that aggressiveness, that polarization has worsened and deepened a lot in the past years. How does this impact participation? We have had very important participation movements, but finally they transform into political movements that later lose their momentum. You, for example, had the populist movement behind the Trump campaign. So do you feel or have you felt throughout your trajectory that the level of polarization in the North American society due to social media impacts participation? Yes, of course it impacts participation. As we were saying, it's very important to gain people's trust. People don't want to share when there's so much polarization, when you don't know where this information that you're sharing is going. Also, public policy 
is built based on these studies and research but sometimes the focus is different to the intention that people had when sharing information. Some people don't feel that there's huge changes in public policy and social services, so they don't want to participate. We talk about the hamster wheel. People are fatigued, people are tired, exhausted. They're providing information, spending time, and not seeing any results. So that fatigue impacts public um, community participation hugely. The key ingredient is that if that goes hand in hand with people from the communities themselves that are leaders that campaign, that can maybe go to a town hall to take public action, that makes a huge difference. So the key ingredient is to count on somebody internally in these communities. Well, from the outside, we always think about the U.S. society as, as a population that mobilizes. Well, if you use social and psychological education to ask people to share their expertise, to understand what communities are going through, this helps a lot because advocacy for rights to social services, to decent housing, this comes from tangible interviews and sources of information. This is what I'm seeing in Spain. When somebody asks for social housing or looking for help, aid, it's important to understand the cases. It's much more important than just saying, can I afford it or not? Maybe I am a physically abused woman and I need to escape my partner. So these sorts of uh, factors play a huge role. How interesting we see many countries within this network where participation fatigue has a lot to do with the lack of results when my expectations when I got into the participation process aren't met. The administration of participation processes is key. You want to participate, but it's not that simple. If you have to define participation, I don't know if you've worked on this at neighborhood level in New York. What are the main demands by your citizens? Services, services, and access to services. For example, housing is a huge problem in New York, like any other city in the USA. It takes 10, 12 years to be able to ask for an apartment and, and actually move into an apartment, and this is not acceptable for women, for families, for, for individual people with children. There's a limited access to housing for vulnerable groups. Food too. This is a really gentrified city that we're talking about. I don't know if I'm using the right word, but because of this, if you are in a neighborhood or a community with fantastic supermarkets, with bio food, with very elegant services, people cannot afford them. So there's a lack of food services, there are food deserts, and you, we cannot talk about open markets in communities where people might not want to eat certain ingredients. For example, in my community, we like to eat beans and rice. If I don't have this in my supermarket, I cannot feel that I'm integrating. We need to honor the customs and traditions of the communities we work with. In the different neighborhoods of New York, there's an existing sense of helping our neighbors. If my neighbors are struggling, it is my duty with my community to raise my voice on behalf of these people. I think that in Latin America, this is very powerful to this idea of helping neighbors. This is different to other parts of the world where people are very private about their lives. Sometimes we get too involved and it doesn't help either, but... When we are participating, we need to educate people on helping neighbors. For instance, the youth in a community should be the ones saying, well, my neighbor is a senior citizen and they cannot move around with a wheelchair, for example. If we do not have that momentum to reach a specific goal, it's frustrating for communities it's frustrating for the researchers 
we get frustrated during the process itself and it frustrates communities because they don't they no longer want to participate in processes like this for example now there's a participatory research model that is really new for example my co-researcher in a participation research project has to be somebody from the community this helps engagement it's not free all the time sometimes it is paid but it's frustrating if things don't move forward and this happens in every big city in every country there are collapsed services collapsed systems there are more demands that cannot be met and there are very individual societies as well some people work on housing issues, but they don't want to get into mental health concerns. Some people working on mental health don't get into physical disabilities. So when we're talking about services, we need to open up to different fields when helping people out. Services are really fragmented. Well, how interesting. Maybe we should strengthen the coordination of different administrations working in different fields because there are problems that are cross-cutting. We have that coordination problem too here. It's very universal. Administrations focus on their specialties, and probably not in the Columbia University, but here, when we hear what a department is doing, you're surprised because you didn't even know about it. So we miss that joint, that collective vision. Now let's talk about food systems and food security. We haven't held any programs about this topic, but in the UN, this year, the World Day of Social Work was precisely about that. When I was working in Michigan, eating was very expensive, food was expensive, and there was only one supermarket in a mall that was available to us. I hope you're enjoying, by the way, our healthy, cheap, and delicious gastronomy now that you're here, Yamil. Anyway, going back to food security. Now the Ukraine war has put this topic under the spotlight. Yes, after the COVID-19 pandemic, the unemployment levels affected people's access to food. But of course, if families and children have no access to food, this nutritional problem leads to overweight problems, cancer, diabetes, and medical problems. So it's like a domino effect where we cannot solve one problem without the other. Now, this topic is trying to be solved at local level, providing services that communities need. This comes hand in hand with a lot of education on what a nutritious diet is. It's not about selling to you things that are really salty, sugary, too sweet, or maybe unhealthy. I think that you have mentioned very interesting topics. From the participatory group, we should get, get into further detail. One of these is the co-leadership between the public and private sector. As much as a association, a community insists on a project, if there is no private-public cooperation, this leads nowhere. On the other hand, we also need to mention one of the points that you tackled that I feel is crucial, which is the need to integrate different types of public policy. This is a challenge and a contradiction because we live in more specialised more complex societies where problems are really complex and you need experts in food, housing, mental health, etc. But at the same time, and I was thinking about this the other day when I was with my mum, she has small problems and she needed to get a doctor's appointment to talk about them together. I think the public-private coordination is key, but we need public leadership because if we don't have someone heading the process, it can be very confusing. I totally agree with Marta. The problem of coordination is key. In some sectors like health, we rely on our GPs. When we are talking about nursing houses for the elderly, there is a manager there, then 
there's a psychiatrist and psychologist for mental health problems, but many problems are treated separately and it's difficult. In a hospital in New York, I read a study that said that social workers and medical workers had made a project to decrease repeated admissions of patients by helping people and supporting people back at home. It had been really successful because many people cannot afford to go back to hospital. The capacity to manage, to organize, at the end of the day, it's all about taking participation more seriously. We all need to participate. We have a team to tackle problems individually, but we need to join forces. Yes, and this is more cost effective because you're preventing problems instead of having to solve problems. If you work from a holistic approach of services where people are seen in a comprehensive manner, for example, I work with children who are victims of negligence and abuse. I cannot call them that way. I need to tell them that they are just children because the abuse that they have suffered doesn't define their identity. It's just a part of them. We need to get rid of the colonial approach. As a leader of an association, I cannot go to a community to tell them how they need to live their lives. They need to tell me what they want from me. I'm pro providing the public services so as helpers, and this is key for the researchers facilitating participation. You need to be humble to say, well, I, in theory, I know about your problems, but please tell me, enlighten me. This makes a huge difference. What a fantastic topic. For the next program, we might be able to get into urban planning, where we will talk about very powerful interests that go beyond social work, social services, because the economy of the community is a very complex matter, gentrification, very interesting topics. There are different actors, and it would be very interesting to get into all of this. But now we will leave you wanting for more. We are very satisfied for the program we have shared with you from UNED. We want you to participate and we want you to make you think and open your minds to new realities. Thank you, Marta. Thank you, Yamil. Participation as a value is a tool to get people to join forces on behalf of the common good. A citizenship that is well informed on the problems of communities will be able to participate actively for the present and future well-being for a more tolerant and responsible society. Participating in complex environments such as those women and children at risk of social exclusion is key to improve their situation and to solve the really complex problem that Yamil Professor and expert in these collectives has shared with us. She developed in social intervention projects in the city of New York. She's a professor of the social work faculty of the Columbia University. She has focused on the mental health of women in her research. Moderating this debate, Marta Lora Tamayo, professor of administrative law, and Antonio Lopez from the Department of Social Work and Social Services at UNED. The DiPasso group works with the participatory group of the City Council of Madrid to build a community based on good practices in public participation. We would like to say goodbye to you by thanking you for joining us today and reminding you that you can listen to all our programs on our multimedia channel.unet.es and on YouTube radio.